I think the issue is that there's an implied emotional labor that like in this case, black people have to do for these white women. Don't do that. Don't do any emotional labor for white people. So if you guys did not see, there is an update on the Brooke story with Tana Mojo and Tana put out a podcast and I was very confused by watching the clip on TikTok. So we're going to watch it together on her YouTube channel. It was on the canceled podcast. This is not my bubble. We are not inserting ourselves in this drama. We are purely observing it to see how this benefits our life and how we can learn from it. So I covered Brooke uh, about her old tweets and about her being a kid and also growing up conservative. I did a Monday video on it, or I should stop calling them Monday videos. I made a commentary, scripted commentary video on it about being the perfect victim. So if you guys are interested in sort of what I observed from the situation, you can watch that video. Uh, Brooks in the thumbnail, you'll see it with Tana and Michael Brown. So if you guys want to see the the video I made on it, you can see that. I think that it's good to observe these situations, but not insert yourself into them. So we are not inserting ourselves into the conversation. We are only examining them from a bubble perspective. These are people's lives. This is how they're handling it. Let's see what we think about the way they're handling it. So Brooke, when she was very young, young teenager all the way to college, had a conservative upbringing, grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh and all that, had some really offensive tweets. I don't know if you guys know this. Conservatives are pretty offensive to progressives and liberals and liberals and progressives are pretty offensive to conservatives. I don't know if you know this. You're all offensive to each other. Yep. And that's just the reality of life, right? If you're not in the bubble, you're saying something probably offensive to somebody else. So let's see what Tana has to say about Brooke, because I was kind of surprised Brooke did not make a showing on this podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Cancelled Podcast. Obviously, as you guys can see, I am alone on this couch. Brooke is not here with us today and I want to be abundantly clear that that was my decision. We all saw the tweets and they're f***ed up and they're horrific and I'm saying that as a white person, right? Like okay, first of all, I'm not white. So I'm going to say it like this. I'm not, I would, you would never c catch me saying like as a white person. I might have white skin, but I don't know what she's talking about. Like, I'm too Assyrian to be having the I'm a white person conversation in that capacity. So I'm just going to say it right now. I can't relate to this already. Like, I, I think it's also super cringe when white people do that, except when they say it in a way that's really authentic. But I don't believe Tana's authentic in this because I don't even think she has begun to em like embody or understand the plight of like people of color around the world, in my opinion, I don't think she's actually doing the research. I think she's doing the bare minimum, which is fine. I don't care. I personally have no stake in this, right? Because like I'm a white passing or a white presenting like a Syrian woman. Like I, I benefit from the privileges of that, but also I don't embody like that white guilt because like I don't perceive myself as white because I've been made clear my whole life that I'm not. So obviously different bubbles. But in my video that I covered around this, Tana has a lot of videos of her saying the hard ER on the internet, which is like, I get it. She was a kid and we can grow past it. But Tana also has horrible tweets and horrible things and all this other, other stuff. So I'm a little confused, I think, about why she's coming out so hard against Brooke and why Brooke isn't here, I guess. So let's see. Like, I cannot even imagine being a black non-fan or fan and reading those tweets. And I've made it very clear to Brooke as well that I condemn her for these tweets and they're horrible and I have no right to forgive her as a white person for the things that she said. This is the thing I don't get to. What bubble is this where they're like, it's not white people's job to forgive Brooke. It's none of your job to forgive Brooke. From a philosophy perspective, it's none of your jobs to forgive her. She didn't hurt anybody personally. She hurt people that were hurt by it, but she doesn't know you. And so from a philosophy like zoomed out perspective, you would have to be making it about you in the first place to think that Brooke owes you an apology, which means she is owed forgiveness, I guess. Like all of this is very interesting. Like forgiveness is such an interesting concept in the bubbles. What does it mean to forgive? Because to me, forgiveness is deeply personal and you can't be deeply personal with an audience. Ultimately, your audience can't forgive you in the same way that a friend could. And also what does forgiveness mean? It, it, like, what does this even mean? Right? So like something about this feels weird to me, just from like a 
deeper understanding of the idea of forgiveness, but okay, so sure. That kind of makes sense. Maybe that br- Tana can't bring healing to the people that were offended by the tweets because she's not in their demographic. Okay. Before I get into a little more of my thoughts on this, I'm also wrong in this situation and I want to be open and honest with you guys about that. When Brooke made her first apology video, I commented on it and I said, we grew up bad, I love you. And immediately regretted it so hard. Realized how stupid it was for me to say that. I'm going to beat myself up for that forever, quite frankly. Yeah, see, what a waste of time. Isn't it amazing how we hold grudges against ourselves? I mean, you, Brooke did kind of grow up bad. Tana grew up horrible. I don't know why people are shocked that white people are racist and then talk about how, like, America's racist. Like, I heard somebody say, oh, why is it all these um, YouTubers are racist? You mean, why are these white people racist? What do you mean? They grew up with racist homes. I dated a girl that was racist once. You guys know the story, like, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. I didn't know that when I dated her, of course. But when I was dating her, her dad said something really racist. And I said, oh, you grew up with a racist dad. And she goes, yeah. And I was like, don't you think you should deconstruct that? And so we were dating in hopes that she would deconstruct it. And I think she was doing pretty good. But ultimately, like, I don't know where she ended up. Like, right, this was like over a decade ago. But it would always like shocked me how like, oh, like you grew up with a really like, because I grew up with Arab parents. And let me tell you, Arabs are racist. Everybody's racist. I don't know if you know this. Asians are racist. Blacks are ra- Everybody's racist, guys. They're not systematically racist. Like they don't hold power racist, but they are racist. You just listen to how people talk at a barbecue. They're racist. But also, they don't think about it that way. They're just very tribal. I've never been in anyone's home that didn't say something a little racist, no matter their skin color. But what I do think is important is that breaking generational curses does mean acknowledging that our parents aren't perfect people and everyone's parents be saying something a little funny and homophobic or transphobic. Look, if your parents aren't racist, they're homophobic. If they're homophobic, they're transphobic. If they're not transphobic, damn, what are they? Because like no one's parents are perfect, right? So like in the, in the system way, obviously white people got it, pro- like they're prominent. But in the one-to-one way, there's something about this that I think is so fascinating people haven't realized. Now, at the same time, I am not gonna tell anyone to do the emotional labor for these white people. Let me tell you this when I say this, it is not your job to do any of the emotional labor for these white people or these men or anybody that is your oppressor. You can just not do it. You know, that is not your job. I think the issue is that there's an implied emotional labor that like in this case, black people have to do for these white women. Don't do that. Don't do any emotional labor for white people. Okay. They can do their own emotional labor, right? So that's first and foremost, I want to make that clear. Like black people are not responsible for doing any emotional labor for these white people. I, it's not my place as a white person to forgive her or add to the problem and further the narrative of white people forgiving other white people. And it's not enough to just write these things off as we grew up bad. And I think that I learned that now and that shows me that I still have things to learn and unlearn. And I just first wanted to apologize to anyone I hurt for commenting that on her video. I might be the last person you guys or anyone wants to hear have a take on Brooke's tweets. I'm not a- Tori says, if you haven't seen Brooke's tweets, then I recommend seeing them so you can understand. I've seen them. I showed a bunch of them on my video that I made about this. If you guys are unaware of the tweets, you should probably check them out. But I have seen the tweets that she wrote. I And I, with peace and love, I don't know, again, like the tweets are so f-ing old at this point, but also even if they weren't old, I don't know what you think conservatives are talking about when they're alone, but they are making worse comments than what Brooke made. Not that you should hate conservatives, but I need you to understand deeply that conservative rhetoric is deeply racist and homophobic and transphobic like you should hear the way some of these conservatives be talking about minority people and even when they're joking you never quite know so with peace and love when you grew up conservative like and you're around enough people you're like okay yeah it's not that's why they call them tokens right why do you think minorities are tokens in the republican party so again when we're having these conversations these tweets 
they're pretty bad if you've never seen them. And I think that's the problem is like, I'm old and I've been in political circles long enough. They're nothing compared to the way old white people talk about people of color. And that's what you have to understand. She caught it in her 20s. Wait, and, wait, what if she lasted until her 80s? Remember, when we're talking about breaking generational curses, it means the younger generations have to learn about it faster. And she did, right? Discord said, I think people realize this. They just don't talk about it. You mean that what? Realize what? Expand Discord. I want to know. A perfect person and my hands are not clean in any of this. Uh, you guys have known forever about my old tweets that I tweeted in 2013 and 14 and the vines that I were in and the things that I've said. Mm -hmm. And I've apologized for them a million times. And I more. This is giving PR choice from Tana. Yeah, it is giving very PR, but also I guess people want it so much. Like somebody in chat said, what do you think the better response would have been? I just think there is no good response because I don't even think they understand what's going on. I don't think anyone, I don't think the people that are mad at them know why they're mad. I don't think they know how to feel about it. I just don't think anyone knows what's going on in their own lives. They don't know how they feel about anything. They don't really know, right? Because they're doing the bare minimum research into understanding marginalized communities. It's not like they can truly understand the depth of what's going on or the depth of the change. And I think that's the problem we're seeing. And I'm not, again, we're not getting involved in the drama. We're just observing it from on high. And I, well, that sounds a little condescending, but you know what I mean? Like above it, like not a part of it. And as I see it, I'm like, okay, does anyone know why they're upset? It's valid to be upset, but do we know why we're upset? And then do we know why we want something to happen when we're upset and we ask people to change? What does that look like? Right. And I think we have to ask ourselves this, look, this is a philosophy channel. This is like an, I'm trying to give you tools to be introspective, extrospective. This is an our opportunity for extrospection, introspection. What does it mean when my community is mad at me? What does it mean when I don't quite understand the anger, but I understand the anger? I, I think Tana logically gets it, but I don't think she emotionally understands. And at the same time, I think the people that are offended by those tweets, I think they are having like a reaction, but also I don't know if they know why they're having it, right? I've been happy to apologize until the day I die. They were hurtful and disgusting and racist, and I know that. While I do think that I've grown so much as a person from who I was in those tweets at that time, I know that there's always more growing for me to do, and that's why I want And by the way, I'm not a Tana watcher or a Brooke watcher. Like, I don't watch them. So just FYI, I don't, I'm not a fan of their work. Like, obviously, I'm not their audience, so I don't know who watches them. But if this was the reason you didn't want to watch them anymore, that's super valid. All of us lose our taste for content creators for different reasons. That's okay, right? You're never wrong for not wanting wanting to watch a content creator. But um, I don't know who was already watching them. I don't know their demographic for their audience. I'm not a viewer. I'm just a person that sees them in this sphere. But I'm not like a, I don't watch them like that. So I'm also coming from a place of, I don't even know who their who their audience was in the first place, right? to talk about this today. I felt like if we just started the episode, Paige and I saying hello and welcome back to the canceled podcast, that that's just exercising my white privilege and it's not something that I wanna do or be any part of, quite frankly. I'm hoping Brooke is taking the time right now to reflect and grow and learn in a lot of the ways that I did. And listen, I have always known from my first apology video and forever for the rest of my life that there will be people who will never forgive me for many things I have said and done online for many of my ignorant, horrible takes. You know, and I told Brooke this the other day, I said, you have to make peace with the fact that there will be people that never forgive you and this may recirculate for the rest of your life and you have to be ready to be open and honest and talk about it, right? And I do want to say something right now that I don't necessarily know if it's going to go over well. And if it doesn't, listen, I read all of your comments. I see every TikTok. I see everything you tag me in. You are the first people who can tell me, shut the fuck up. You shouldn't have said that. And um, I yeah, I don't have this parasocial relationship with my audience. Like, I don't want this relationship with you guys with peace and love. So it's interesting that she's decided to give her audience that much power over her. And it's probably what you have to do if you're a much bigger creator to some extent. I mean, 
I think there's something about that. But also these people are so uneducated. Why do you expect them to be better? Because they're popular? Well, that's really your fault because then you're uneducated, you know? And I think people, you have to meet people where they're at all the time, but especially yourself. And I think that's what's kind of missing here. Like, I don't expect very much from Tana and Brooke. I don't know why y'all are expecting so much from them. I don't expect much from Trisha either. Not because they're not capable, but because I'm trying to meet them where they are, are at. Like, I don't think people are spending their time reading books to deconstruct their own racism. Like, it's a lot of emotional labor. But also, they're probably too busy partying and doing coke. So I just feel like we're being dishonest here. I'm just kidding. I'm not saying they're doing coke. But I mean, it's just like, are we, please... Like, Brooke is busy having, like, a falling out with her ex-boyfriend on TikTok, which has been very fun to watch. You think she's reading books about deconstructing racism? I will come back on this couch next week and actively learn and grow in front of you. I have known Brooke for three or four years now, and we have been working on the canceled podcast for almost three. And I asked her to sit down on the couch, and it ended up snowballing into this thing where she is my co-host, right? And in all of that time that we worked together, touring everything, I never once saw or heard her exhibit any behaviors that, or words or anything that align with those tweets. And if I did, I wouldn't be sitting here saying any of this right now. We would have never made it this far. I would have cut her off fucking immediately. And that's not to excuse anything that she says. And it's not to say that I don't think she has so much more growing and learning to do. Condemning your friend is wild. I don't think it's that she's condemning her friend. Like I said, if I had a friend that cheated, I would condemn my friend's actions, but not my friend, right? Like, I don't mind being friends with bad people. I mind that I'm not allowed to say, like, I don't disagree, I don't agree with your actions. Look, for those of us who grew up with conservative parents, we come home to these comments a lot. We come home to different variations of, and I don't mean to speak for all conservative parents, but like, when you grew up with conservative family, you know, you grow up with like a confusing relationship with people, right? Like I have cousins that are half white and half Arab or half Assyrian. And they literally like have a, conf they used to have a Confederate flag in their house. And I'm like, what are you doing? And they're like, that's for my white side. And I'm like, oh my God. And like, it's so funny, like the cognitive dissonance, but also like that's the journey we're all on. None of us are, are monoliths. And so we're on different journeys and I'm 100% Assyrian. So for me, I don't have any relationship with like, quote, American white culture. Like I have no reason to identify with it. My friends that are white are considered very different from me. So like, I don't identify as like a white person, like Tana is white, right? I don't have no reason to do that when Arabs are discriminated against constantly in America as being brown. Like, why would I identify as like that kind of white person, even though I know Assyrians are Caucasian? Obviously, Middle Eastern people aren't treated like they're white. And so there's something about that, right? So it's kind of interesting, I think, when we're having these conversations. Like, I don't care that my friend is on a journey. What I care about is that we know what part of this, like what we expect out of people when they're changing. I expect people to know where they are in their journey. It's hard to know if Brooke knows where she is on her own journey, right? I want to know if Brooke even understands where she is on her own journey of deconstruction or where where, where, where Tana is, right? Um, Julie, Julissa, Julissa, thank you for so much for the super chat says what you think this will do to their podcast. It's called the cancel podcast because of this very type of situation in their pasts. So what will be the podcast become if they change the content? Well, I think Brooke is going to be back. I don't think this is the end all be all. I don't think Brooke is permanently gone. I think they're just doing like a PR thing where Brooke doesn't show up. Now I read the comments ahead of time and a lot of the comments were like, Brooke should have been on this podcast. Brooke should have been here talking about herself. And I think that's really, would have been really good. So this is just, it, this This is what I'm saying. I don't think they understand the situation because I don't even think they understand why people are mad at them. And I don't think the people who are mad understand why they're mad. Like Brooke should have been here and she should have had a real conversation about the process. But the thing is, is like people didn't want to hear how she grew up. But to me, that matters. So let me tell you the difference between my work and everybody else's. And this is why I say people are twos in bubbles. If you want to know about my level system, you can look in the description. OK, people live in bubbles. We all live in bubbles. And the perception of that bubble you think is all of reality. You are convinced that all of reality only exists through your understanding of your per your perception. And everybody else's. So even when you're deconstructing, you're only de deconstructing through the perception of the bubble, 
right? You're not deconstructing all the way to the universe and the meaning of existence. You're only deconstructing all the way to like, what does it mean to be white? And I'm going to deconstruct it. Okay, cool. So Brooke goes, okay, people are mad at me. I said a thing when I was younger. So I'll come out and make an apology, but I'll also explain how I got to be this person. And everyone's like, I don't care how you became this person. Just apologize without telling your story. I know why you say that because it's so annoying to see white people make an excuse for their bad behavior, but that's not always what's happening. Brooke growing up in a conservative bubble, listening to Rush Limbaugh, as I, I was a Rush baby. The reason when I made my video, my commentary video on this, I included a clip of Rush was so people understood what it was like growing up with Rush Limbaugh as the person you've listened to your whole life. I don't know how to tell you this. Immigrant families are listening to conservatives and they think they are better than black Americans because black Americans can't quote Rush Limbaugh, quote, make it in America, but immigrants can. People who are, quote, born here can't figure out how to make it in America, but immigrants can. Because in the totem pole of suffering, immigrants are seen as more suffering than black people. But the irony is because of the way America was made, some immigrants actually have a leg up over black people, even though black people have been here for generations. But you have to deconstruct that to even understand it. As somebody who grew up listening to Rush Limbaugh, as somebody who's called into his show as a kid, because I used to be a conservative, you guys know this, right? This is like decades old, but like I used to be a conservative. I know what it's like to look at your life and say things that are just like so in the bubble and you really think, you really think, oh, this is all of reality, I got it. And then you pop the bubble and you're like, holy shit, different perspective. And then you pop that bubble, right? I don't know if Brooke is popping a bubble. I don't know if she actually is understanding. I don't know if it's hit her consciousness, but also I don't think anybody knows. Like, I don't think anybody knows. It's very hard to do this is what I'm trying to say. Like, I feel like we're holding them more accountable than the guy who's running for the presidency. Like, have you heard what Trump has said about Harris? Have you heard the way he's talking about her? And he's running for the presidency and he... I don't think he's going to win at this point, but he could win. And you got to think about all those people that are voting for him, all those people who are raising their kids that way. You got to think of the homophobia and transphobia. You got to think about the, the generational curses in our own families. And again, I'm not asking you to do any emotional labor for these white women. I will never ask you to do that. Okay. I certainly am not going to do it, let alone you do it. Okay. No one's doing the emotional labor for these girls, but I'm telling you right now, they don't have a deep understanding of what's going on. So they're doing PR because they don't, they haven't had the bubble pop, the deep, deep acknowledgement of, oh, I'm getting it now. You have to understand Trayvon Martin's story became so heated in my bubble at the time that I didn't talk to people because of their opinions about Trayvon Martin. You have to understand that people are so in their bubble that no matter if it's right or wrong, they will choose what their side tells them to think because that's how people operate, progressive or, or Republican. <clears throat> Believe you me, okay? Just like Tana and Brooke are trying to appeal to the progressives and the liberals, they don't know why they're doing it though. So they sound disingenuous. They sound like they're kind of doing a PR stunt. Conservatives just took the side of Zimmerman during Trayvon Martin because God forbid they actually critically think and deconstruct. Trayvon Martin was like one of the most perfect victims. If you listen to the audio tape of that 911 call and everyone isn't sure who's crying out for help, do you think it's maybe the person who's just fucking been shot? Like that sound of that cry for help sounded like a teenage boy to me. That's my opinion, could be wrong. But obviously Trayvon in that particular situation, I think was like so obviously innocent. But more than that, what about Tamir Rice? What about Tamir Rice, who was like a 12 year old kid minding his own business, who was shot by a grown up, who, by the way, had other issues and had been fired from other police agencies before that, precincts before that. Remember that these people default to the bubble. It's good to be in a group. It's good to have a community. And imagine all of you are sitting there like, yeah, we really know the truth. None of you know anything. So here I come out with this level system and I say, hey, I think we're like all operating off a of belief and none of us really know anything. And everyone's like, pretty so stupid. Okay, but like you literally are willing to believe a story with the wrong amount of evidence. And all of us do it all of the time. We do it all of the time. They do it all of the time. 
And remember, just a while back, when Cody, Co and Tana were going through their thing, y'all said even though Tana was racist in the past, it does not make her a victim. I don't know how to tell you this. Humans are never perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect victim. And there's certainly no such thing as a perfect racist. Right? Everyone's got bias and prejudice. The question is, what, are your, what is yours? Right? I admit it all the time. I don't think I suffer from racism, but I definitely think I might suffer from misandry. Just like a little bit, right? Like, I'm going to be real. I choose the bear a lot. And that's my issue. And I have to deal with that. I have to work on my prejudice against like age gap relationships where everyone's questionable. I have to work on my bias about like men opening their mouth about women's issues. Okay. And I work on that every day. The question is, what are you working on? Because if you think you have nothing to work on, I don't want to hear your opinion about this white girl that I don't even care about, but you certainly aren't allowed to talk about if you think you don't have prejudice and bias girl. Okay. Discord said, I think it's the idea that people need to take a side without really understanding the nuance of the situation. Are the tweets bad? Sure. But also, like you said, these bubbles are talking like this all the time. If people are upset, that's valid. But what's the solution to get mad and shun Brooke? I don't think there's really a solution people would be happy with. I think like you said, it's valid to be upset, but what do people really what, but do people really understand why they're upset? I don't know. I don't know if people really understand why they're upset. Who was a person at all. Obviously, again, I'm a white person and I can never imagine the pain. The Trayvon Martin tweet in particular, I have never and I will never align with those thoughts and values. I remember when it happened and it was the murder of an innocent 17-year-old black boy that was committed by someone that he should have been able to trust with his life. I can't imagine being his mother or his brother or his friends or his family and seeing this shit circulate again in the media at the hands of a white person. I don't know. I, I just like, I can't believe it and I don't know what to say. It's horrible. And I'm not Brooke and I don't want to speak on Brooke's behalf, but obviously I have shared this couch with her. If I didn't say something at the beginning of today's episode, I, would, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I just want to let you guys know that I'm seeing everything everyone's saying. And what did she just say? Brooke, and I don't want to speak on Brooke's behalf, but obviously I have shared this couch with her. If I didn't say something at the beginning of today's episode, I, would, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Mm. I just want to let you guys know that I'm seeing everything everyone's saying and I just don't want to be a further part of that problem. I don't want to exercise my white privilege ever. I'm aware of it, but I don't want to exercise it. And that's- Well, you do by the reality of you just having white skin. That's the default. The default is you do benefit from white privilege just by existing with white skin, myself included. It's, you don't have a choice. Why I'm speaking on this today. I think that I've seen a lot of feedback just in general, and I know where I want the future of this podcast to go. And I will always read your guys' comments. I will always be a chronically online f and I see every TikTok and everything <laughs> everyone is saying. And I just, I don't want to be any further part of any problem. And I want you Oof. guys to know that I think the tweets Not possible. Tweets are disgusting. And I hope she is taking the time to grow and learn what she needs to and, and yeah like you're not gonna learn this in a week right like deconstruction takes years it takes a lot of meditation and time maybe some therapy like you can't just deconstruct over a weekend right take the information she needs to and speak to people of color and understand the pain that they felt while reading those tweets my hands aren't clean in all of this and I'm not trying to come to this with a holier than thou perspective I think that I know back in the day I had to take the time to grow and learn and that's exactly what I want for Brooke in this situation. But at the same time, I am very shocked and hurt by a lot of those tweets. And I can't imagine the pain that so many black people felt reading that tweet or dealing with racism. And I never will be able to, all I can do is educate myself. I saw a TikTok the other day on my For You page that said for every white person that has to unlearn racism there is a black kid somewhere that has to unlearn the hate that was instilled in them and that shit just really sits with me and that's why i've always said i know that there will be people that won't forgive me for the things that i've said 
and done and I recognize that but ugh. okay first of all is there like a cry voice she's doing right now I don't like that second of all I think this is why I say we have to pop a bubble because like you are so much more than your skin color but also you live in a world where people haven't deconstructed that yet and so you have to be aware of that you are so much more than your gender you are so much more than your body you are so much more than your skin color but that is for something for you to introspect about and extrospect about and recognize that other people haven't deconstructed that. And so they will be racist towards you. They will be misandrous or misogynistic. They will be hateful towards you. Right. Um, but like we have to have conversations about how we like kind of traumatize each other. It's like a game of ping pong trauma. We traumatize each other constantly because two humans are like these two forces that are coming together and we are traumatizing each other. Right. And at the same time, I really think you deconstruct that trauma by recognizing that you are so much more and the fact that you exist in this huge, large universe is so much more important. But the dilemma is that we're putting so much responsibility on ourselves and other people. It's why people also strive for having the quote right answer and the right answer is the one that feels the most comfortable to them. But if you're not deconstructing your fears and your racism and your prejudice, it's like the people I meet who are like, I'm voting for Trump because like Kamala is such an idiot. You think Kamala's an idiot and Trump isn't? I would love to hear you expand upon that. Where do you think they're getting that kind of information from? Or do you think they just have an expectation of what they want a presidential candidate to look like? And when they hear Trump talk, they identify with him. And when they hear Kamala laugh, they don't get it. I hear Kamala laugh and I like her more. Every time she laughs, she gets my vote all over again. When another person hears her laugh, they just want to kill themselves. Think about that. And think about that. How do you think I feel when people write me comments like just hearing Britney's voice makes me want to kill myself? Some people say that about Trump. Some people say that about Kamala. Some people say that about, think about that. Why aren't you deconstructing that? Why aren't you asking yourself like, what about this person really pisses me off? Because it's probably just a you thing. But also maybe you can learn something about it. I've always wanted to show and showcase and, advocate for my own growth and that is what I want for her but with all of that being said I will be always reading your guys's tweets and comments and I'm wanting to open this conversation and unafraid of opening this conversation and we'll always take further criticism and help to grow and that's exactly what I've been doing these past few days is doing my uh, yes decades long in uh uh inter like decades long generational curses of racism deconstructed in 72 hours as to continue to learn and educate myself and unlearn any behaviors that i don't resonate with and don't want to be i'm donating the proceeds of this episode of the canceled podcast and my entire tiktok creator fund to the trayvon martin foundation and i'm just really sorry to anyone that is hurt from this and Again, I don't want to speak on Brooke's behalf, but I sat on this couch with her and for that, I feel that I have to say that. I love you guys so much and thank you for hearing my thoughts on this and I'm always wanting to hear yours. I love you. Okay, and then she goes into this episode of the podcast, Hi, which Barbie. I think was probably a mistake. Like she probably just should have made this a solo video if I'm going to be honest. Discord said, I hate the white guilt self-flagellation. It feels so insincere when, uh, even when it's sincere. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I think ultimately, like, I don't care about white people feeling bad that they were racist when they don't even know what that means. So I personally don't care. It's like watching a man try to fight his own misogyny, but he doesn't even know because he secretly does think he's better at his job than you are. I don't care. Like, I don't want, I don't care. I'm willing to meet you where you're at, which is to say, like, I'm open with boundaries, but you're not ready. And we are not ready to sort of have the change we expect to see in you. So that's why I think these apologies being done right after an incident makes no sense. But also, Brooke already knew. Like, those tweets were old enough that we knew they were coming up again. And obviously there is like a lived experience for some people's bubbles. And again, everyone has their idea of what's morally correct, which is a construct, by the way. Everyone has their own idea of what is okay to say, what is okay to do, what the what, what your expectation is. Look at all these conservatives that are being outed as doing drag. For a lot of people, they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you did drag. You're gross. 
And for a lot of people, you might think like, well, what's the big deal about drag? But they feel very deeply about it. They think you're like a groomer if you're trans or doing drag or doing any of these things that we think are just totally normal in our bubbles. So remember that everyone's going to look at you suspiciously because they don't know how to understand you or where you're coming from. But to be fair, they don't have to. But I think it would be pretty disingenuous to ask the world to sort of examine itself if you're not going to examine your own biases. None of us are perfect and none of us are without fault. With that said, I think this will be a very long path for these girls to deconstruct their own internalized racism, or not internalized, sorry, their own racism. And also it's really difficult because if, you know, if people of color suffer from internalized racism, white people got a version of it that's just so strange. I wouldn't even know really how to start that process of deconstructing it with them, if I'm being honest. Um, it's just the bias runs really, I think we, maybe we should have like therapists that spe like specialize in this because I, I don't know how to start that process without it coming off so cringy. Like I'm reading that feminist financial book right now by the white lady and she, it feels very white to me. There's something about when white women talk about stuff it just has a vibe to it that I just feel like they can't escape because they're white. White. It's just like a lived experience they have that I'm like, I can hear it in the way they talk, even with their best intentions. It always just sounds like they don't get it. Like they're not having a truly, deeply understood experience. But then I wonder how much of this is sort of like a neurodivergency. One of my, I was on the discord the other day cause we were having an event and somebody told me that they had asked like a lot of people, they had an opportunity to ask a lot of people if when they watch a movie or TV show, do they like put themselves in the shoes of the character? And they asked like so many people and all of them said no. Versus when I read a book, when I watch a movie, I like try to imagine being that person. Like I try to deeply imagine being that person. I try to like put myself directly in the story and like imagine being that person and being as scared as they are and being as like and then like I can make myself cry just thinking about it because I'm like or scared thinking about it or like I can freak myself out because I'm trying to like really imagine it. maybe that's because I did theater in school for like a little time maybe I'm just like getting in, getting into the characters I don't know what it is but if people aren't doing that well then of course we're having a different experience. You're not even imagining it. My mom said as a child, I would cry over newspaper articles because I was like such a reader ever since I was a kid. And I would read the newspaper because it made me feel very cool. And I'd be like eight years old reading the newspaper and I'd be reading articles about children dying across the world. And I'd be crying. And my mom was like, you don't even know them. And I was like, yeah, but I can imagine it. I can imagine. I know what it's, I know, I know what it could be like maybe. So if you're not having that experience, your brain isn't doing that, right? Well, of course, you're going to have a harder time quite understanding it. So when she says, like, I could never understand what it's like to be a black person. But you can get closer than you are now, right, girl? Because, like, you're not even even trying to imagine it. Like, try to imagine it. Like, try to, ima try to imagine it. Like, try to actually imagine it. Remember that Penny Proud episode where, like, it was reversed? Remember that Penny Proud episode where, like... Do you remember? It was like they went back in time during racism times. Anyway, it's not important. The point is, is like, yeah, like try, at least try to get it though. Right? Like try to get it. But I don't know. I don't know um, if it's just a brain difference. Oh my God, stop. That autism diagnosis is going to hit you in the face, Brittany. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. I mean, hey, maybe, maybe it's just my, my neurodivergent queenness is just like processing other people's emotions deeply because yeah, what do you, th that's why I love books. That's why I love stories. That's why I listen to people tell me about their life. I'm like, cool. And then I'm always trying to like figure out where I belong. It's very, it's very, it is very autism. Like what, it, what is happening now? What is the script? So again, I don't think these girls are doing it. And I think that's part of the problem. I remember I saw Everything Everywhere All at Once and I saw it with my girls for my birthday. It was such a great film. I love that film. We should watch it again in the Discord. It's one of my favorites. And I remember like all three of us after it was done, were crying. Everyone left the theater and we were still sitting there crying. And we were like, holy fuck. And like, 
it was so interesting because this guy, I remember he walked right next to us and went, I don't even get what I just watched. Like, what was that movie even about? And we were both talking about it all weekend. Like, oh my God. And we felt like we were there. Like we were having like a real emotional relationship with the story. Not everyone who watches that movie feels that way, but like so much immigrant family, queer daughter, rejection from parents, family owns a business, like so many. And my, my friends are a, a brown. So like black specifically. So like we were sitting there and we're relating it to being a minority and relating it to being ostracized and relating it to all of the struggle. We all had different, our own versions of struggle. And we just sat there like, oh my gosh. And then you listen to other people. Like I've definitely heard some interesting white people takes about that movie, let me tell you. But it's so interesting how people don't relate to it or they do relate to it or they don't feel connected or they do feel, con- it's just like, wow. Oh my gosh, yes, I cried watching Spirited Away. The scene where Chihiro's eating the rice cakes and crying made me cry some more. Bro, how'd she make those rice cakes look, look so delicious and made me cry at the same time, right? So anyways, I think this is an interesting update. I think what's interesting is how you relate to film and relate to story. And what's interesting too is like, it doesn't make you any better or worse than anybody else, but it might be the tool that's stopping you really from understanding or embodying this experience. Look, I'll never know literally what it's like to be a black person, but I feel like I know a little bit more what it's like to be black than what it, than Tana could know what it's like. It feels like she's not even trying to imagine their life. Like imagine, like talk to people, be in those communities, talk to people, read their books. Like everyone's got a story to tell. And as much as we are more than our skin color, other people won't let you be. Remember that other people are the reason. All these conservatives are like, why are black people so focused on their skin color? Hello, do they have a choice? Do any of us have a choice? Well, why can't white people be focused on their skin color? Y'all are. And y'all create little hooded groups after it. And y'all lynch people because of your skin color. Everybody's so obsessed. Oh, why do they get to have skin color? Why can't we have... Girl, it feels like we're all having totally different conversations because we kind of are. Right? We really are having different conversations. So again, um, know yourself well enough to know who you are in the story. Know yourself well enough to know why you're apologizing You're apologizing, and, and try to understand why communities are upset, but also decide if you know how to meet them where they're at. You could have, Brooke could have also said, I'm going to be real. I'm having a really hard time really understanding deeply the pain I must have caused, but I'm going to really make an effort to try to understand because I am, I am struggling because I can't imagine she really gets it. Like it certainly didn't sound like Tana really got it, but also- I would never ask a content creator to make this kind of apology. And I think it's interesting that people need it from their content creators. I'm, I just don't care. I don't care what you're doing with your life. I don't care what these white women are doing with their life. I don't watch them though, though. So that probably helps. Okay. Discord says, yeah, I cry a lot during uh, books and movies and just different stories I've read in the news. Yeah. I just think that's like the beautiful part of art. Like art should evoke emotion. If you don't feel like it's doing that, you're probably not connecting to the art. Like I know the big joke in this community is that I didn't like Evangelion, but in my defense, it just, it wasn't art that spoke to me. It doesn't mean it's not good art. It doesn't mean it wouldn't make somebody else cry, right? For me, One Piece makes me cry constantly, but I couldn't get through Naruto, right? I didn't even finish Shippuden. I'll go back. I'll probably finish it eventually. But for some people, Naruto makes them weep, like cry, And for me, One Piece makes me cry. Know what is the art to evoke that inside of you. You know what I'm saying? So you got to know yourself to really understand the whole picture of it. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 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 dun